Well, for this Advent season, as we anticipate and wait on the coming of the Lord, and specifically this season celebrating the birth of Christ, um, we're going to be waiting and celebrating the gifts of God at the same time. And to get us started, I really want you to think about one of your favorite gifts of all time that someone has given you. Um, and don't be all high and moly, holy, high and moly either, but high and holy. I mean, think about material gifts uh, that someone has given you. And I might ask for some answers, but be careful if your spouse is here, the way you answer this. But we'll just think, pause for 10 seconds and see if anybody comes up with some favorite gifts. All right, anybody want to share favorite gifts? Of, all right. My first dog. Your first dog? All right. All right. Todd? Oh, he was. <laughs> Any others? Yeah, Ron? First bicycle. First bicycle. I can remember that as well. Over here. Yes, ma'am. My stuffed pig moo moo. Stuffed pig moo moo. All right. <laughs> Any from this side? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Harry. Be my first wife. Your first wife. <laughs> I told you to be careful. <laughs> we, better, we better move on from that. <laughs> I was thinking about a couple gifts, and well, I had a couple great gifts this week. First, you know, Mary Lou and Kathy, you know, babysitting our kids, and Linda baked us a wonderful pie. And so all those gifts are coming from that side of the room. So, <laughs> y'all need to catch up over here. All right. So, uh, but the um, 10 or 11 years ago, one of my favorite Christmas gifts, Melissa bought me satellite radio package um, right when they were first coming out. She knew how much I enjoyed listening to sports talk radio and she bought me a system that was portable that you could put in your car or you know, have at your desk and you know what a wonderful gift and I've been hooked ever since and now you know the cars that I have they have to have satellite radio and uh, it's even more important than safety and gas mileage Just make sure I have crisp and clear radio coverage uh, nationwide uh, wherever I go and those kind of gifts, and I can remember childhood gifts, as we've mentioned a few as well. And, and then sentimental gifts, or human gifts too, um, are always important to think about this time of year. Many of you are thinking about your um, spouses or grandkids and you know, what exactly they want this year and what would be the perfect gift to give someone that you love this year, this Christmas time. And all that's a lot of fun and and, and somewhat important this time of year as well. To, the important part comes in bringing families together. And that's all cool and well too. But when we think about these gifts, especially um, items that were given to us um, either by Santa Claus or our parents or grandparents, um, we think about these gifts and you think about, well, how long did I actually stay enthusiastic about it? You know, maybe when you first open your pig moo moo, right? Pig moo moo. Uh, maybe that um, you were so excited and very enthusiastic, and when your grandparents came over to visit, that one might have been the first gift that you showed them. Uh, maybe in January when they came over again, you were still excited about moo moo. Uh, but maybe a year later, uh, not so much, uh, because you had other stuff that has come along, and and so we kind of lose that enthusiasm. And then as time goes on, I'm sure, um, like Ron, I'm sure Ron's not still riding his bicycle around town. <laughs> At least I haven't seen it, because if I had seen it, I would have taken a picture and it would be up here for us for our enjoyment. Um, but that bicycle is probably long gone, uh, because those kinds of gifts, um, you know, they, they deteriorate over time. Or they're given away, uh, or to be recycled even, in some cases. Or even thrown away uh, because they're completely broken. And that's what happens to those sorts of gifts that are given to us. Well, 
What we're talking about is a completely different type of gift when we talk about the gifts that God gives us. Specifically in the next four weeks, we're talking about four uh, really important gifts that God gives us. And thinking about God gifts, God's gifts, we have to um, juxtapose that against up and against these physical items that we might get from Santa or from loved ones. Because the gifts that we're talking about here in the sermons over the next few weeks, uh, they don't deteriorate. They don't break. God's gifts are irrevocable, the scriptures tell us. If God gives us something, um, He's not going to take it back from us. Regardless of how you and I treat it. The only way we can lose that gift is to just simply give it back. But as long as we try to retain that, uh, God's gifts are irrevocable. And so right off the bat, we have a huge difference. Is that we don't have to worry about losing this gift. That if we want it, and we want to keep it, then God's willing uh, to do that for us. God's gifts don't um, deteriorate over time. We don't need to send these gifts of God's off to the blacksmith to be repaired. We don't need to have them refurbished if it's electronics, like electronic gift. Uh, because God's gifts don't change over time in terms of, in a negative way. They don't deteriorate. They don't need to be uh, recovered. We certainly don't have to um, send them back to be replaced. Uh, and I know that a lot of times it's very disappointing when you open a gift at Christmas and it just doesn't work. And how sad that is, especially for a child. And then on top of it, when you can't take it back to the store because you got it from Amazon because it was cheaper. And then your parents say, or your kids say, oh, it's just daddy being cheap again. And uh, they don't really say that. They know that, but they don't say it. So... Uh, but anyway, so that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about God's gifts. And then most importantly for us, um, as we go about living out these gifts that God gives us, is that if it's truly a gift from God that we've received and accepted, we don't lose enthusiasm over them. We don't lose excitement over the gift that God has given us. In other words, uh, we can't wait to tell someone about this gift uh, it just automatically comes out of us a year later or two years later from the time that we actually received it. And that's a wonderful part about these gifts from God that we're going to be talking about for three or four weeks. Well, today's gift uh, that we're talking about in this opening part of the series is the gift of joy. And the joy that comes from God. And so we're not just talking necessarily about being happy or being a jolly person like St. Nick or Rick. Um, now see, Rick, I told you if you sat over here, I wouldn't pick on you. I pick on people on the right, but, uh, but you're right in front of me. You've got to sit further over by Cindy. So, uh, all right. But anyway, uh, we're not, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about genuine joy um, that is a gift from God, that is irrevocable, that won't break, that can't be uh, destroyed, and doesn't have to ever be replaced or refurbished. It's joy that is in you and in me. In our hearts, in our souls, every cell of our body that enables us, regardless of our circumstances, to just have a glow about ourselves. Amen? Amen. So happy has to do with circumstances. Joy is forever and an everyday uh, state of being. And that's what we're talking about. We get a little clue of this from our scriptures today. In both cases, and first the Gospel of Luke, um, that first century audience um, is hearing this for the first time. I imagine them having this letter or this Gospel read to them after Christ has gone on to heaven. And so these words are recorded, and we hear this teaching, and it's the first century. They're being persecuted. Uh, they don't know exactly what's going on in their life. Um, everything they know about their way of life has been destroyed or at least is in danger of being destroyed. And they hear these words about a future promise. And, and in terms of you know, this is where your joy lies in that in the future Jesus is indeed going to return to finish what was started at the cross. And so in all these gospel stories we hear this as part of the story that yes, Jesus has died Jesus has risen again. Jesus has ascended to heaven. And Jesus will return. And it's with that return that um, all these things that are going on in your life will be no more. 
and, in, and, in, and that you should be encouraged in that. In Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, it's one of the first letters uh, that we have in the Bible, first writings that we have in the Bible. Um, he's writing to a group of people saying, first century church, um, that again, being persecuted, they're in danger of falling apart, they were strong, now they're kind of weakened by uh, the delay in the return of Christ. And so their faith is kind of shaken by that. They thought Christ was coming any day back, and that hasn't happened. And so Paul is writing this letter to encourage them. And he's saying, hey, you may be in a lot of pain and discomfort right now. In fact, you might be dying, or your loved ones are. Um, but you can be assured that Christ is going to return, and that the same Christ that died for you on the cross... If you claim that for yourselves, he's going to return for you and make this all right once and for all. And, and that's the key word there that I just mentioned is assurance. Assurance that Christ died for you and died for me. That's the real source of this gift of joy. Assurance. That is where you and I claim for ourselves the work that Christ did on our behalf at the cross. It's the assurance that death no longer is the final answer for you and I. And when we claim that, we call that assurance. Or you should feel that assurance. That no matter what else is going on in my life, I know that that's not the final answer. I know, in fact, that sickness does not define me. I know that poverty does not define me. I know that the death of a loved one doesn't define our family. I know that whatever terrible circumstance that is facing me right now or that I'm in the middle of is not the final answer. And it's through that way of thinking, and not just thinking positive thoughts, but acknowledging your difficult situation, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't have that kind of stronghold on your life. It's that place that we want to be in in order to allow joy to take over even in our biggest challenges. And, that, and that's what Paul is writing here to the Thessalonians. I know, Paul says, that you're going through a difficult time. I know you thought the end was near for evil. But I also know that God is true to his word and that Christ will return. And in the meantime, here's how you're supposed to live. And if you read the next few verses uh, for homework, you're going to see exactly what Paul asked them to do in the meantime. And it's all centered around love, loving one another and loving the community. You do that while you wait, and that strengthens your joy. It's that kind of assurance that leads to joy that we're looking for. Um, I know that you know, in the midst of this season, in the midst of our week, um, we've lost a great saint of the church in John. And, uh, and that, that saddens all of us. And we acknowledge that we are grieving. And that Jenny and Elaine and Amy and all the grandkids are grieving. And we grieve right alongside of them. Many of you are here in the church today, or some of you, are here because John um, invited you. And John nurtured your relationship with God through Christ at this church. And for that we give thanks. But one of the things that I want to lift up about John is that the whole time that I knew John, he's been struggling with his health, or he was struggling with his health. For this whole year and a few months that we've been here, he hasn't been well. And in the midst of all that, um, he was diagnosed with cancer at the same time um, that my dad was, basically. And we were, they were having some same sort of tests and treatments. And so I know very well what John was going through at the time and in those times. And I know in the midst of even his own battle, the unexpected loss of his lo the love of his life, um, right in the middle of all that. How much can one man take? But you know what? If you ever sat down with John, you never would have noticed. Never. Never would have noticed. And that's something else he had in common with my dad. And I'm sorry to make it personal as well, but it's a connection. Is that you could look at John and have a conversation and you could still see you know, even if there was a little bit of pain on his face because of what was going on in his body or his heart, um, you could still see the joy coming through. And the reason he had that joy was not because his circumstances were great, 
but because he knew that Jesus had died for him. And isn't that a wonderful place to be? That no matter what treatment lies ahead for you tomorrow, no matter what kind of pain you have to go through to try to get better, knowing that you're probably not, that you can still be jolly and joyful. You can still laugh. You can still crack a smile and tell a good story when you're planning the funeral of your wife. That's the way John was. And it's not because he had great parents or a great son-in-law like Rick or a great preacher like me as his pastor. <laughs> it's because he had the joy of the Lord inside of him that came from assurance, being assured that sickness and in death was not the final answer. And that's the source of his joy that's available to each and every one of us today. If we're in a season of struggle or challenge where we don't experience that kind of joy to where if we were diagnosed with a fatal disease, that would be the end of us spiritually and emotionally, um, then we're not in a good place and we need to get there. And we get there one simple and direct way. And that's claiming Jesus Christ work for us ourselves personally or reclaiming it once again over again and we can all do that and we all need to do that at times and seasons in our life if you're struggling you're in great company because all of us have seasons of struggle and challenge in terms of our own faith mother Teresa had dark nights of the soul and there's no better soul on this earth and in terms of what she gave up to help others and she struggled with her faith where she didn't have the joy um, that was supposed to be evident in terms of someone that served. But she reclaimed Jesus for herself and she got there. John Wesley, our founder of the Methodist movement, struggled half of his adult life even after he was a priest. Even though he grew up in a most faithful family of a priest and of a mother that uh, helped raise them in the faith. And it was an awesome experience for him growing up. He had everything he needed to know who Jesus was. He knew the Bible backwards and frontwards. He knew all the 10 cent words that I don't know, but Dr. Melissa does. Uh, he knew all that stuff. Uh, yet, he did not have the joy and that comes from the peace and knowing that Jesus died for himself. So we're in great company. But he found it one night when he was hearing a a reading, reading of the epistle to the Romans by Paul. And he discovered, and it's on Aldersgate, Aldersgate uh, Street. Uh, he was at this society meeting. And it was 1738, give or take a year. And uh, he claimed Jesus for himself. And that's the night that he says he felt his heart strangely warmed because of the peace that came over to him when he finally realized that Jesus died for him. Even him, a sinner, he died for him. And it's from that point on that John Wesley experienced the joy in the face of any situation that came his way uh, that exceeded all explanation, as Paul would say in the scriptures. You can even tell it in sermons, pre Aldersgate sermons, pre joy sermons, and post joy sermons of the recorded works of John Wesley. And so, even pillars of faith like that. Um, you know, we can look to and say, hey, we're in good company. And uh, as we search for that joy that sometimes is missing in our lives. I love that, and we can close with that Charles Wesley um, wrote a hymn a, a year after um, his own conversion experience. It's the first hymn in our hymnal. If you look at number 57, it's a favorite of Methodists all around the world. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. It's number 57. Charles Wesley wrote this. And he had his conversion experience just a couple days apart from John. but Because he was going through the same struggles of you know, doing the work of the Lord. No problem there. And knowing the scriptures, no problem there. But he just didn't have that joy in the face of difficult situations. But he found it when he claimed Jesus for himself. And he wrote this wonderful hymn. And in fact, if you turn over to page 58, you see 17 verses of the hymn. Maybe we could stand and sing all 17 <laughs> verses. And see how fast that zaps our joy. Um, but the reason I raise it is that I love you know, that first line. What he's saying is if he had a thousand tongues, he'd use them all. 
to tell people about this joy that he gets in the gift of salvation. And then it's the type of gift uh, that Charles couldn't even stop writing about it. That's why there's 17 verses. He could not stop explaining how he felt in response to the gift that God had given him in terms of salvation. And that was a year later. But in fact, he spends the rest of his life writing hymns, many of them uh, that we sing today. And so it's just one more reminder that this gift of God called joy that comes from assurance um, we don't wane in our enthusiasm. If you have it, if I have it, it doesn't go away. We don't wane in our enthusiasm or our excitement just because we have a tough day. A year later, we should be just as excited as we were the day we said yes to Jesus. This gift does not deteriorate because it's God's gift. We don't lose this gift like we lose our toys in the box of bins in our basement. We don't lose Moo Moo, or we might lose Moo Moo, uh, but we don't lose this gift of joy that comes from God through assurance. This gift isn't breakable. All right? We might break some of the things that we hold dear to us and we can be uh, devastated for a moment. But this gift of joy that comes through assurance of our salvation is never, never going to break. In fact, it's going to get stronger. It's going to grow exponentially in us and in others because we can't help but exude joy when we've been saved by Jesus the Christ. And that's the kind of thing that multiplies through people like John and others who love their Christ and what Christ has done for them. So I encourage all of us that are gathered here today to use all of our tongues and all of our ways to say thank you to God for this gift of joy. And if you feel like you need to reclaim it today, then reclaim it today. If you need to reclaim it tomorrow, reclaim it tomorrow. But if it was ever there in your heart, it's still there. It may just need a little coaching to come out. Because that's what God's gifts do. They never leave. And so it's a wonderful way to start our Advent season together as we wait to celebrate Jesus the Christ as a baby and we wait for His glorious return to finish what was started at the cross. It's for each and every one of us to claim the joy that lived in John and others in our lives as an example. That lived in Mother Teresa, that lived in John and Charles Wesley, and that lives in each and every one of us who claims Christ as our Savior. The gift of joy from God through assurance. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.